Well, I hope uh, you moms are having a happy Mother's Day. You know, moms have been real important to, uh, to us. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for moms, right? I was just thinking about the song that Barb sang that uh, he knows my name. Think about the names that our mothers gave us. And then if there were more children involved, I know when I was in trouble, my mom would know my whole name. <laughs> John Edwin. If I heard the John Edwin, I was, by the way, bless her heart. She pronounced it John, John, so I was John Edwin, and um, I was in trouble. And then oftentimes she would also be doing a roll call to try to get to the right child that was in trouble. <laughs> that ever happened in your family? Yeah. yeah. Diane, Paul, John, John, John Edwin, you know, those things. Moms, we appreciate you. Also, we appreciate those ladies who have had a hand, maybe not having children of their own, but they have had a significant hand in shaping and forming families' lives and boys' and girls' lives. So may God bless you on this day. By the way, you see the baby crib over here? Been wondering what that's about. When you get your baby bottles filled, you put them in the baby crib. Now, until we have bottles in there, if you need a nap, <laughs> but we're not moving the bed to the back. You've got to sleep in front of everybody up here. So. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Joshua, chapter 1. Continuing our little short series, God is on your side. Um, today we're looking at the life of uh, uh, looking at a, the account of Joshua, God was speaking to him as he was taking the leadership role of the people of Israel, the Israelites, the Jewish people. Next week, we'll be looking at the book of Jonah and how uh, God was on his side in spite of what Jonah may have thought. And last week, we looked at probably one of the greatest leaders that we find within Scripture, that is Moses. Even with all of his faults and all of uh, the times of doubt that he had in his life, doubting that God could really use him, he still, Moses still rises head and shoulders above other leaders that we have seen in Scripture, those who have heard the call from God. It was Moses that God used uh, to confront Pharaoh and uh, to deliver the ten plagues. It was Moses who God used to part the Red Sea. It was Moses that God called him to go to the mountaintop where he received the Ten Commandments to give to the people. Over and over again, as you read through the life of Moses, we see how great of a leader he was and how God used him. And so he led Israel for decades and was probably one of the most respected men in God's history. But there came a time for Moses to pass the leadership baton, the mantle of leadership uh, that he had held for so many decades to Joshua. And you think about being Joshua being the guy that follows the great man of God who had proved himself over and over again, to follow in the footsteps of a man such as a, that was such a giant of the faith. And the good news that we see through this today is that God was not only with him every step of the way, but God also offered some instructions some words of encouragement to him as well, too, to accomplish what God wanted him to accomplish. I doubt if any of us are in a position that is exactly like Joshua's, but many of us need to hear these words of encouragement that Joshua heard 
when he needed it the most. I believe that what God told Joshua can be applied to us and our own lives today. So let's look at about three things here this morning. You have an outline that's been included in your bulletin this morning as well, too. Let's begin reading in Joshua chapter 1. Look at verses 1 and 2. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. God said, the, one of the first things he said to Moses was, uh, to Joshua was, Moses is dead. Now, why do you think God said that to Joshua? Well, Joshua is taking on the new leadership role. He's following a man of tremendous faith and stature, and and people respected him and look, and looked up to Moses. And Joshua was the new guy now. In essence, what God is saying to Joshua: You're the leader, but I want you to remember this. Moses is dead. Let go of yesterday. Let go of the things of the past because I have a new day in front of you. Today is the day that you begin the new role of leadership. He was saying it because it was time for a change and it was time to quit looking backward and start looking to the future. When Joshua looked back at the past, what did he see? Well, he certainly saw the high expectations of the people, that this is what they expected out of him, because after all, this is the way Moses did it. Joshua expect you to follow, do what Moses has done. He had seen the, the expectation of the people. And, and now then, he had seen miracle and miracle from Almighty God that had been worked through Moses. He had seen this great man of God do incredible things and take amazing steps of faith as they walked side by side in leading the people. Now, looking back at yesterday and knowing that that uh, he now was the one that was to lead the people of Israel, there's no doubt that at some level Joshua felt insecure and a little bit inadequate. I remember the first church I was called to pastor there in Don, Missouri. Never pastored before. Those people took a chance on me. God has a special place in heaven for that, for those congregate, for that congregation. And they did not mean it intentionally or to make me feel bad, but they were trying to use it to help, but it didn't help me very much when they kept telling me how much they loved their former pastor, Wayne Combs. <laughs> Brother Wayne would always do this. This is the way Brother Wayne did it. You know, it took me a little while to kind of overcome a little bit of insecurity and paranoia because that's what the expectation was. I've heard it at Green Valley. Oh, when Brother Glenn Lawson was here. <laughs> Brother Glenn. Yeah. We get insecure. We begin to feel. But you know what God is saying to Joshua? Moses is dead. Let go of yesterday. Joshua, today I am calling you to lead these people. I'm giving you a fresh vision. I'm giving you a new future. I'm giving you an opportunity to do some things with these people of Israel that Moses could not do. I, am, I have called you. You must move forward. Too often in our everyday lives, we base our future on what, have, what we have seen or what we have done in the past. 
God's word to Joshua and his word to us is to let go of yesterday. It doesn't matter what some el- someone else accomplished or how someone else would do things. Moses is dead. God said to Joshua, it's time to move on. God wants you to take on the role that he has given you. And that's what we need to hear today in our own lives. What is the role God has given us today in May, on May the 14th, 2017, here in the 21st century? What is our role today, not only for our own personal lives, but corporately together as a church for Green Valley Baptist Church to impact this community? That's what we better be seeking instead of looking back. To all of the yesterdays. God is a God of vision, of promises to be with us, of helping us to move forward. We need to let go of yesterday. Something else Joshua needed to see, not only to, to assume this new role of letting go, but also he needed to be able to claim God's promises as he led the people of Israel. And God has promised us that he's going to be with us in any venture we take for his kingdom's sake. He chooses for us to be part of, in other words, he is going to equip us with whatever is necessary to get the job done. Look at verses 2 and 3. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. God has promised Joshua that he's going to be with them. And there are several promises we can claim throughout Scripture. God promises He's going to do some things for us. For one thing, He has promised us that of God's will for our lives. He will give us a purpose. He will give us a plan. He will give us an opportunity to serve Him if we are willing to discover that. And to discover God's will for my life... I must be willing to invite him to be the Lord of my life, for him to direct me, which means who's going to be in charge, me or the Lord? Okay, that was an easy question, I thought. Who's going to be in charge, me or the Lord? Lord. All right, you get an A minus on that. Now, once we've accepted him as Lord, there are several ways that we can discern God's will. Well, through Scripture. Psalms 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God will show us through his word what he wants us to do, what he wants us to be. Through prayer. James 1, 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Through counsel with godly people. Proverbs 15, 22. Without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. Through circumstances. Remember the story of Esther? Esther. Esther, a servant girl who one day found herself willing to confront the king over how the the people of her people, the Jews, were being treated. Conspiracies were all over the place. Bad things were happening. But she had the king, she had an opportunity to have the king's ear. And there was a guy named Mordecai that had some wise words to her. He said, he sent a message, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish 
And who knows whether or not, listen to this, whether or not you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. There are times and things in our lives, there are circumstances that God raises us up for a time such as this to make a difference for His kingdom's sake. And oftentimes we may be reluctant to do it, but God empowers us, God gives us strength, God gives us supernatural courage to take the stand that needs to be taken so His kingdom can be advanced. And we can follow His will and we can be where He wants us to be. And also, don't think it's all, well, it's so rigid, scripture, prayer, talk to people, circumstances. There's a neat thing about God and how He loves us and how He wants the best for us because also He will oftentimes use our desires to get us into the place where He wants us to be. Psalms 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. But we got to be in the Lord for that to happen. Trusting Him, yielding to Him in our lives. We also have the promise of God's power and God's presence in our lives. Look at Joshua chapter 1, verse 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. We need to understand that God will not send us any place where He cannot sustain us. You may you want to write that down. That's a pretty good sentence. God will not send us any place where He cannot sustain us. Now, once you can understand God's will for your life, you need, to, you need to have faith that He will be with you every step of the way, no matter what He has called you to do. And when we understand that God will always be present with us, you know one of the things, that one of the results of that, knowing God is always with us, you know what it does for John? I hope it does it for you. It gives me a little bit of confidence that it's not up to John. God is going to be with me. And He is going to give us the confidence that we need. He's going to help us gain a new perspective. We're going to have a new peace that will come within us. And we will have the courage to face whatever may come our way. We also have the promise of God's prosperity and success for life. You may hear prosperity preachers on TV from time to time, but let me tell you, this is the God of prosperity here that's a little different than what you're going to see on television. Listen to what God said, not some... Listen to what God said. <laughs> Yahoo, that's what I was going to say. <clears throat> Only be strong... And very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. God's plan. Notice what we have to do. We meditate on His Word day and night, the book of the law. Do according to all that is written in it. Be strong. Be courageous. Don't be frightened. Do not be dismayed. God is with us. You see, God will not only reveal His will to you, He will not only give you His power and His presence, He will also move you towards success in fulfilling His call upon your life. Now, sometimes we have to be careful how we measure success. Sometimes we, we put some artificial measurements of success. I tell you what, in my travels all across 
the United States and working in different churches, different state conventions, different associations. I have run across some folks, some pastors and some very small churches who are faithful day in and day out. And there would be a lot of people that would look at that, maybe that pastor in that church and they're running their 30 or 35 in their little small community. And, uh, and they would say, you know, this guy must not have it. He doesn't, uh, that church isn't growing. There's a lot of things happening. And I'm telling you, I'm thinking some of those guys were the more faithful guys than I see the guys on television. They hang in day in and day out. They're consistently taking care of what God has called them to do. Let's be careful about artificial measures of success. God is the one who truly judges success. We like to put other parameters in place. But let's be careful about that. Let me ask you this. Can you imagine having a guarantee that when you start out on whatever God has called you to do that you're going to be successful? That's what God gives us when we do His will for our lives. So God is saying to Joshua... Let go of yesterday. Moses is dead. You're the new leader. You're the guy who's in charge now. I'm I'm calling you to lead us. Let go of yesterday. Claim the promises I'm going to give you. But there's one other thing, Joshua, that you need to come to grips with. You got to meet my conditions. You got to meet God's condition. He will do all that he has promised here. But there's also some expectations laid down for us for this to take place. And number one, he said, we need to study the Scripture. Let me give you a little illustration about about this. I've been flying for a number of years, going to meetings, going to all different places, seeing family, all that stuff. And from time to time, as I'm flying someplace... I am able to get an exit row on a flight. Now, the exit row is a good place to sit because there's a little bit more leg room. But with that privilege also comes what? Some responsibility, right? You get on the plane and you sit in your seat on that exit row and you get yourself all comfortable. You got your overhead stuff stored away. You got your small thing underneath the seat in front of you, you got your iPad out, your book you're going to read, and here comes a flight attendant and stands right in front of you. And they will ask you, do you know you're sitting in an exit row? And you say, yes, I know. Then they're going to ask you, are you able to help us in case of an emergency? And the answer you're supposed to give is Yes. And then they will ask you the question, have you read the instruction card that's found in the seat pocket in front of you? And I think to myself, I read that about four years ago. And if you answer yes, they may come back with another question. Are you sure that you know what this instruction card says? Because if we run into problems, I am depending on you. All right, that puts a little different spin on things, right? So you, I wait till they leave, then I get the card out. <laughs> look, at, look at the door, and you think, well, how hard can this be? You turn the swivel, we'll push the door out, you can get out. But it occurred to me one insightful moment, and I have those occasionally, that I was like some of the people that sit in my congregations. I hadn't really read that exit card. I didn't didn't know what the MD-90, how you get out of a plane like that. I knew about the Boeings or whatever. But how many times do we sit in Bible studies or in worship services? We hear the preacher preach, but we haven't really read the instructions for our own lives. That's what God is saying to Joshua. He said, meditate on my law day and night. Study the scriptures. 
We need to be spending regular quality time with God's Word. Um, you say, well, man, it's hard to read and hard to understand. Just start doing it, and God will show you some stuff. Just start it one way or the other. Simple as that. Second thing, not only we need to know the Scriptures, but we also need to be obedient. We need to obey God. God said, not only do, do we need to study His Word, but we need to do what it says. Head knowledge isn't going to be enough. We need to be live, living what we are learning. So we need to know God's Word in our head. That's memorization. We know a few memory verses, don't we? Well, God says you need to know my, my Word, know it in my head. You need to store it in your heart. That's meditating on it. We need to show it in our lives. That means we visualize. Other people can see God is in a part of our lives. Then we sow it into the world. We go out and be evangelist. We also need to be strong and courageous. Twice God says to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Joshua's going to face all kinds of pressure, like things like you and I have never dreamed of. He was about to take over the leadership of the people of Israel. Hundreds and thousands of people are to be looking for him to show them to the promised land. There were battles to be fought. Lives are going to be lost. Tremendous pressure and, tr and stress at every turn. Yet with God's promises and with God's encouragement, Joshua, he would face all of these things with the strength and courage that's beyond what mortal man is able to handle. I read a story about Eric Weyenmeyer. He's a blind guy. And on May 25th, 2001, he reached the peak of Mount Everest. He had, uh, Eric had a degenerative eye disease. He lost his sight when he was 13 years old. But that didn't stop him from, from wanting to accomplish what he had dreamed of. So on, on, a, on a mountain, when 90% when of the climbers never make it to the top, and over a hundred some odd people have died trying. Eric succeeded in large measure because he listened very, very well. Listen, this is how he did it. He listened to the, to the bell that was tied to the back of the climber in front of him so he would know the direction to go. He listened to the voice of teammates who would shout back to him, Death fall two feet to your right. Well, he knew, don't go two feet to the right, or that would be it. He listened to the sound of his pick jabbing the ice so he would know whether it was safe to cross. Now, most of us will never climb Mount Everest. But if we're serving God, if He is the Lord of our lives, if we are trying to do His will, not only as individuals, but collectively as a church, you know what, folks? We are on a venture of a lifetime. And when we accept God's will and God's way into our lives, we'll find the strength and the courage, like Eric did, not just listening for a bell, but to the God who has called us and instructed us. We have the strength, we have the courage that can come to us only from listening to His voice. What's He saying to you today? Do you need encouragement today? Is God putting something on your plate that you think, this is too big for me to deal with, this is too big for me to handle? God's given us a way to trust Him, to follow Him, and to be encouraged by Him. And this is what He has said to us, that He will be with us every step of the way. How do we know that? Because He is able. He is able.
to walk with us in whatever we face, wherever He leads us. And He has promised to go with us each step of the way. And to make it a little bit sweeter, He knows your name. He knows where you are. He knows who you are and where your needs are. And He is able to meet those needs. I'm going to pray, then John's going to lead us in a hymn of commitment and decision. And we invite you this morning. If you need encouragement from God, you just come and yield your life to Him. Take those steps necessary to be what God wants you to be. And He'll lead you where He wants you to go. Father, across this room, there's all kinds of needs. I pray, Father, you're even in this time of worship this morning, through the words that have been spoken, the songs that have been sung, the music that has been enjoyed. Father, someone has found encouragement today, and they will walk out of here knowing that uh, life is, is better, life can be stronger, and they can be more courage- courageous because you have promised to be with them. Now, you know the hearts of each are here. I ask you, Father, just your spirit move in their hearts in these remaining moments today. And I pray, Father, that all that's done today, you will get the glory and the honor for. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.